Welcome everybody to the Data Unlocked closing keynote. I'm very uh, honored to be here with Nate Silver, the founder of 538 and uh, renowned author for sure. So Nate's going to walk through, which I love the title of this slide or of his presentation, the 11 commandments for data for better data analysis. It's uh, I'm very excited to to listen in and then have an opportunity to do some Q and A at the end with you, Nate. So. If you do have questions, please use the Q and A uh, box in the uh, on the panel there for you, and we'll address those at the end of Nate's presentation. So, with that, Nate, please take it away. Cool. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, um, and thank you all for spending some of your afternoon with me today. Um, I wrote a book called "The Signal and the Noise" that was published uh, almost exactly ten years ago, September. Um, 2012. Um, I'm working on another book now about gambling probability, uh, risk and rationality, um, which is a lot of fun. I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of very smart people. Um, and I'm a data practitioner myself. I still build a lot of 538 models. I like to dig in the weeds. I, um, I play poker. I used to play poker professionally many years ago. Um, but I'm not just someone who's kind of at arm's length, I'm trying to actually dig in myself. Um, so these are 11, I guess the presentation is called 11 Commandments. I want to soften that a bit to like guidelines for better data analysis. They're more helpful hints or helpful suggestions. Um, they're not terribly technical. They are mostly kind of attitudinal things that I think um, reflect what to do in environments where you're dealing with challenging problems. You're trying to make predictions, where you're trying to build an algorithm or a model when you're maybe not even being data-driven per se, but trying to be rigorous about working through a hard problem. Um, the first three of these are literally kind of from the conclusion of the first book that I just mentioned, The Signal and the Noise. And the latter eight are things that are kind of, um, I've found just useful heuristics over the course of my life, things I've learned from talking to lots of smart people in other fields. I work on this new book. Um, so let's get started here. I think the kind of opening bid um, for any way that I think about the world is this, which is just think probabilistically. Um, if you look at any <clears throat> 538 product, what are the odds that the Yankees win the World Series or that Democrats keep control of the Senate? All those forecasts are probabilistic. It's not because you're trying to hedge your bets, it's because the world is uncertain. And that describes the realistic state of what we know and, and what we don't. And a lot of the art is really in figuring out how to actually have well-calibrated probabilities and not just say, who's going to win, who's going to lose. This is really quite atypical. Um, I, uh, one thing I'm working on for the new book is trying to figure out what are existential risks like nuclear war. So I'm talking to a lot of experts about the chance of nuclear war in the Ukraine or how it could escalate. Um, it's amazing how many people who don't know what they're talking about will be incredibly confident about oh, Putin would never do this, or actually we're on a very dangerous track record here. Um, in general, when people are, um, are overconfident, saying this will definitely happen or definitely not happen, then they wind up being wrong much more often than you would think. It's a big kind of theme in the first book is that most predictions that you see are, are overconfident, part because they make for better TV, but they're less reliable in practice. Again, just think about how uncertain, just from the standpoint of forecasting an election, for example, how many developments there have been in the world in the past couple of years. Um, Ukraine, I mentioned, Roe v. Wade versus overturned, uh, being overturned, inflation going up and down, hurricanes and everything else. Um, the idea that just because we have more data means everything is very predictable is not true. The world is highly complex and often the best we can do is to think in terms of probabilities and not absolutes. Number two, Another really important one, uh, know where you're coming from. Um, so I believe there is an objective world out there. I'm not some type of postmodernist, I guess you'd say. Um, but none of us have a monopoly on the truth. We are all kind of scrounging around based on our own point of view to try to describe this world that we all share. And we all have biases as individuals. We have priors and preferences and goals and incentives, things we share, things we don't share, um, experiences. So, uh, so the whole question is, how do we as a group collectively become smarter and more wise about what the world 
actually looks like. Um, and again, when you get together as a group, there are risks and rewards. On the one hand, it's certainly true that collective intelligence is almost always better than any one person's opinion. On the other hand, there's always a possibility of group think that I kind of lead everybody off a cliff, everyone trusts one another when maybe they shouldn't. And so this is an important question to study. Um, one book I'd recommend on this question is James Surowiecki. He is a writer at The New Yorker, a book called The Wisdom of Crowds. And he studies what happens when we get together as groups, whether as competitors, maybe there's an industry of people competing for the same resources, or as collaborators working on a team um, at your company or at your business or in an academic institution um, or in a political party, whatever else. And he finds that crowds are wise when three conditions are present. Uh, one condition is diversity. So this can mean um, like racial and gender diversity. I think it certainly helps to not have everybody look alike and think alike, but also different modes of thinking about the world, different skill sets, different backgrounds. Uh, again, having 100 of the same person is not 100 times better than having, <laughs> having one person, right? Having 100 different people who all have different skill sets and attitudes and backgrounds, that can be much more helpful. The second condition is independence. So if I have a viewpoint about the world, if I have some data, am I able to convey that in a way that um, provides information to the group or to the market, if you prefer? Um, and I don't have to hedge or, or hide my kind of true preferences, right? Um, if I have great ideas, but I have a boss who makes me alter them so that the boss doesn't look bad, then all that work I've done is kind of not very productive. The last condition here is trust. Uh, if you have a market, you want trust that contracts will be honored. If you have a team, you want trust that everyone's working toward the same goal. Unfortunately, in America today, indications of trust are on the decline. If you look at trust in every institution from big business to the media, to the Supreme Court, to, uh, to the Congress, to the White House, to pretty much everything except for the military, it's gone down. And so taking trust for granted now is something you can't really afford to do. So thinking about mechanisms to enhance, display, and provide trust, I think, is, is more important than ever. Number three, this is the last of the original suggestions from the book, is try and error. Um, if you're looking at the presentation, you see a neon sign depicting Bayes' theorem, which some of you may know. Um, and all Bayes' theorem is, is a centuries-old mathematical equation describing mathematically how you incorporate new information with what you already know. Um, so if you're at a conference and you're beginning to meet people, you may start out with certain priors, as they're called, about what a person might think. And these are probably pretty crude stereotypes based on where they work or what they look like or how old they are, how they're dressed, whatever else. As you collect more information, you refine those views to have more and more accurate estimates. Of course, the flip side of that is that you're never entirely done. Your views of the world are always a work in progress, which means you're always sensitive to new evidence, although you do converge toward more accurate views over time. Um, again, though, this intuition doesn't really require any fancy mathematical equation. It just means that you learn a lot by testing different ideas, by getting feedback from participants, by seeing what works in the real world and what doesn't. Again, because I've had enough kind of applied experience, I know that whether you're like running a website or building a model, um, there are always things that look good on paper, quote unquote, or on a whiteboard and don't translate so well under real world stresses. Maybe the data isn't the same quality that you were expecting. There's some condition that you didn't anticipate. So again, I'm a big fan of uh, getting your hands dirty, not spending too much time in the lab and, and actually having hands-on experience with um, with customers, with data, publishing results, refining and improving over time and, and, and getting to a better solution that way. And in fact, one sub theme of the first book is that fields where there's more constant feedback, you tend to have more success. So baseball is a field, for example, where, um, where there's been a lot of progress with statistics and analytics over the past couple of decades. But one thing about baseball is that you play 162 games a year. Every player gets 600 at bats a year. So you are able to revise and refine things pretty easily. Another field where there's been a lot of success and improvement is weather forecasting. Um, hurricane forecasts have improved a lot. We had a forecast in Florida recently that was not quite as good as people were hoping, but still 
Um, hurricane forecasts have improved by leaps and bounds, in part because weather forecasters deal with many storms every year. You have atmospheric conditions 24 hours a day in hundreds of locations around the country. Getting constant feedback and refining is, is really quite vital to, to any type of predicted activity. Number four, this one almost seems so obvious that it wouldn't be necessary to say, but I think it's it's pretty important, which is that it's important to define the problem. Um, one other thing I'm working on for the new book is talking to researchers in artificial intelligence and um, discussing how do computers or algorithms quote unquote think versus how do humans think? And this is a contentious debate and different systems have different strengths and weaknesses. Um, one good thing that algorithms do though is that they they have to define a particular problem a particular loss function a particular um utility function human beings aren't so good at that if you kind of wake up on a saturday morning without a clear plan of what to do maybe uh, your spouse is out of town your kids are at camp or whatever um wait know what's your function that you're trying to fulfill you want to have fun maybe you would go out with your buddies you want to get some work done maybe you go mow the lawn or something by contrast, a computer is trying to solve a particular problem. And so, and so if you are trying to build an algorithm of some kind, um, understanding what that objective is and defining it in a way that is mathematically tractable and achievable is really quite important. Um, for 538, this is pretty easy because our goal is in almost all cases to maximize predicted accuracy. Um, how you measure that is a little bit more Interesting and contentious, we are most concerned about something called calibration, which means that if you say a certain outcome is supposed to occur 70% of the time, it should occur 7 out of 10 times. Not 10 out of 10, not 3 out of 10, it should occur 7 out of 10, and not occur the other 3 out of 10 times. That's our definition of it. Um, but knowing what your goals are and being, frankly, like fairly precise about that is, is pretty important. Uh, number five, this is one of my favorite ones, treat data as guilty until proven innocent. And I think this kind of separates out people um, who have a lot of hands-on experience working with big data sets or even small data sets for people who don't. A lot of the time, just cleaning and collating and, and gathering the data and gut checking the data is where 90% of the actual hours come in. It might not be the most interesting or fun part of the job, but it does require a very keen eye toward detail, and it is very important to do. For the congressional midterm forecast that we make at 538, for example, we use like literally something like 22 different sources of data. And believe me, if you have a bug in the code, if you have an error in the data, if you have a glitch in the system, that's gonna affect the forecast and people will, people will notice that. So doing your quality control upfront, if something doesn't make sense, pausing to uh, understand why the value that you have in your spreadsheet or your model is what it is and not kind of um, ignoring that and hoping things work out okay later is a very, very valuable intuition and skill. The other theme here is that although it's always nice to have bigger data sets, the first thing you're solving for is usually quality, not quantity. Um, one famous example from one of my worlds, polling is the Literary Digest poll in 1936. If you're a huge political dork, you might know about this, otherwise probably not. Um, it's 1936, the election is between Franklin Roosevelt, the incumbent president, and Alf Landon, the Republican challenger. A magazine called Literary Digest polls 2.3 million people, which is a lot. Um, if you have a typical poll from NBC News or something, they might poll 1,000 people, 1,200. This is 2.3 million people, so what can go wrong? Well, it turned out the poll was very wrong. It predicted a big landslide victory for Alf Landon, and of course, FDR won re-election instead for yet another term. Um, so what happened here? Um, well, it was a biased sample. The reason it was biased, uh, the short version is that people who subscribed to magazines back during the Great Depression were much richer on average, and, and then richer tended to be more Republican than the American population as a whole. So if you are uh, have a lot of ammunition aimed at a biased target, then then the quantity of data doesn't really help you at all. Just kind of make you more confident in an incorrect conclusion. Number six. This is kind of another one that I consider uh, just a really important offshoot of hands-on experience working with complex data sets. But I call it 
kick the tires. In other words, it's very important to stress test both your data, as I talked about in the last slide, and your actual model or algorithm. Um, in particular, you want to have a sense for whether small changes in inputs or code or model design reflect large changes in outputs, right? So if there are two debatable ways to do something um, and the answer goes from zero to 100, then you kind of have a problem on your hands. You either at that point need to figure out which method is right, or sometimes if you can't do that, just taking an average of the two. Um, robustness comes from, uh, from understanding that you usually would want to take multiple approaches to a problem. When you're dealing with small data sets in particular, with small sample sizes, there is probably no one right a priori inherently correct model. And the best thing you can do is to look at all reasonable approaches um, and see how sensitive your answer is to different model designs. And sometimes, frankly, if it's very sensitive and you don't have enough data, the answer might just be that, hey, we don't know. Here's a suspicion that we have. Here is where we had to bet if we could hedge a lot. Um, but again, don't be overconfident about a situation where you're dealing with a big, complicated, novel problem for which you don't have sufficient amounts of data. Number seven, break it down. So you sometimes hear the word analytics, like in baseball analytics or um, chemical analysis. What the word analyze literally means, the etymology of that, it means to dissect or to take into pieces. So really the kind of core element of statistical analysis like regression analysis, for example, is this kind of dissection factor. It's being able to say that we are dealing with lots of different examples of phenomena, but we can try to boil down as well as we can into here are the one or two or three or four underlying causes that propel all these different examples that we see. Um, you know, sometimes the word, you might hear the word decoupling, right? Are you able to separate out one factor from another? Are you able to say, well, maybe I don't like <laughs> this person, but they're good at their job, for example, is a non statistical example of that. Are you able to um, put things into different buckets? This skill tends to be highly correlated with analytical ability. Um, sometimes you also see when I talk to people who take risks for a living, I've talked not just people who are like in finance or playing poker, but also people who are like literally like explorers or founding businesses. Um, the ability to be cool under pressure um, and to ignore extraneous information when you're under conditions of stress and find essential information, breaking a problem down into essential parts. It's hard, but that's a skill set that's extremely valuable to have for yourself or in your organization. Number eight, learn the rules of the game. So what I think statistical analysis is really about is kind of in these two steps right here, part seven and part eight. These are like kind of where the nitty gritty hardest work comes. So first, you're breaking the problem down into components that you can reassemble. And then you're kind of learning what the system actually looks like. You observe data, you analyze data, then you want to understand kind of what are the drivers of the problem that you're trying to solve. And you want to have you want to have theory here and derive theory from your data. This is kind of the scientific method, in other words. In basketball, for example, if a certain player is successful, you want to know what are the attributes that drive that success so you can extend that to other players that if you're an NBA team, you might be drafting that player. In poker, like I said, um, if you're studying poker, I actually have someone who is a poker coach, like some people have a tennis coach. You go through and look at computer outputs from a hand that you played and try to understand what are the principles here. Um, again, structured thinking is very important. I think people don't spend enough time thinking about thinking, thinking about their thought process and what things are productive and constructive and what ones aren't. Um, one more example, this is weather forecasting. I mentioned before that weather forecasters are a big success story in terms of having gotten much better over the course of the past few decades. Well, they are marrying data with theory. They're not just trying to solve regression models. They actually understand how the atmosphere works. And so they're able to solve problems in a directed way that's not too abstractified. And that's, that's, that's kind of everything if you're really going to add value. Number nine, now we're back to some kind of more practical learned advice. Um, number nine, don't lead with your gut. So I think a lot, it comes up a lot in poker, for example, about when should you kind of trust an algorithm or a formula or a model 
versus kind of overriding that and going with your gut instinct. Um, one book that's really informative on this is Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is kind of an introduction to all different types of cognitive biases. Um, he talks about two systems that we use to think about different problems. System one is fast, intuitive thinking. If you are driving and a dog runs out onto the road, you are not commissioning some McKinsey study or running a regression analysis to see what you should do about that dog. You are relying on your experience as a driver. Um, if you have more experience, you are much less likely to handle that situation incorrectly. Most everyday problems we're dealing with system one for. System two, by contrast, is slow, deliberate thinking. You know, how should society deal with like a new pandemic is a problem that we should try to use system two for, maybe we didn't, but that's a system two type of question, right? If you have a son or daughter applying to college and they're debating which college to go to or whether to go to college, probably a system two decision. You wanna think about how they're gonna be happy, but also they probably wanna maybe come together with a list of different pluses and minuses for different options that they might have. Um, the thing that I hope is becoming obvious here is that your gut may work really well for situations where you have a lot of experience, but people sometimes use their gut in big, novel, complicated problems where they don't have experience, and there, there you don't want to trust your gut very well. Um, what you might want to do, though, is to use a gut check at the end, and the more practice you do have, the more you can refine your conclusions and say, hey, look, this answer doesn't look right to me. This data point looks like it might have been produced by some type of erroneous process. You have to be careful with this because that is a situation where you can introduce unhelpful biases sometimes. So I think sometimes getting 80% of the way there with your model, trusting the process, and then at the end, doing a gut check, whether with yourself or maybe some other helpful person who's a peer or a colleague or even a competitor, that's often where you, I tend to add a lot of value, I think. Number 10, uh, don't be afraid to be critical. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be impolite or that you're gonna be a bad colleague. But if you look at kind of systems that evolve where progress is made, I mean, progress occurs to some extent because there is competition and there is selection between different ideas, right? I think people don't realize now, although there are some negative trends now, for example, life expectancy in the US has declined. I think people don't realize how much there has been growth in life expectancy, health outcomes, declines in poverty, increases in wealth and overall well-being. That kind of all comes through kind of competition and progress and science in the economy and everything else. And that needs some way to filter out better ideas from, from worst ideas. It doesn't mean, by the way, that it's a zero-sum game. If there is some new technology and the market is selecting which implementation of the new technology is most valuable, then that produces dividends to a consumer, potentially. Um, but you know, if you work for an organization to have competition within your organization, the less likely you are to be outclassed by competitors outside of your organization. This sometimes is why you have like the innovator's dilemma where companies start out with an edge, they become complacent, people have incentives that don't necessarily lead them to improve their product anymore, and they are sometimes overtaken by a much smaller, but uh, leaner and smarter and hungrier competitors. And it means letting people voice dissent about a project on a team without having too much fear of repercussion. The last one here I think is the most difficult in some ways to, to implement in practice, but I think it's maybe the most important of all, which is to focus on process and not results. This is something you hear, for example, in poker a lot where um, you don't control what the undetermined cards are that come down in a hand, right? If you get your money in with the favorite hand, 70% favorite, and the other player makes a flush or a straight, then you not only did everything you could, you actually played the hand well, and you're gonna kind of make money in the long term. So poker players get this, um, you know, sports bettors get this because they have so much experience and they have so much of a large sample to deal with. They know that the long run really does prevail in the end, but it sometimes can be harder in real world situations where we are not used to understanding the role of luck versus skill in a game. Um, the other example you see here, this is actually a um, mountain peak in Argentina called Aconcagua. It is, I believe, the tallest peak in South America. Um, 
So for my book, I talk to people who take risks, including people who are literally explorers. I talked to a guy who has explored the seven summits, which are the highest peaks on every continent on Earth, as well as the five deepest uh, ocean trenches. So a lot of exploratory experience. And the nearest came to death was on this, frankly, rather scary looking peak in Argentina, um, where he slipped on a rock that he thought was stable and was not. It was not clear whether he would survive. Fortunately, a Sherpa was able to find help and he was rescued and recovered in the end, but it was a near-death experience, the worst he'd experienced by some order of magnitude. Um, and I asked him, so did this kind of cause you to reevaluate your process? And you would think most people would say, yes, of course. It really made me realize how much risk I was taking but he said no. And the reason why is he understands that when you're climbing one of the highest mountains in the world with little oxygen, whatever else, that you are inherently taking some risk, sometimes on paths that no human being has ever actually taken before. Um, you can step on a rock and there's going to be some one in 10,000, one in 100,000 chance that you're going to slip. Um, there's only so much preparation you can do to avoid that. And the goal of being able to take more risk um, is by being more prepared and more meticulous as possible. One other thing this guy has done, and he was actually an instructor in the Air Force. If you have seen, for example, the movie Top Gun Maverick, um, you'll see Tom Cruise's character talk about how, oh, you have to kind of trust your gut to the last slide. Um, don't overthink things. People who actually uh, are flying missions like that would disagree with that advice for the most part, right? They say being as prepared as possible lets you navigate a higher risk, more challenging environment. Yes, you hope if something goes wrong, as it often does, that you um, have an experience base that lets you infer and impute and maybe solve a problem that you hadn't been thinking about before. Um, but you really want to be prepared and meticulous and to have a good process and understand that sometimes there is risk, sometimes there is uncertainty and focusing on, do I have the best process and not the results is, is the way to go in the long run. So I hope some of that is helpful. I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but, but thank you all for joining me so far. Awesome, very good, thank you so much. Uh, that was, uh, I love, I love the, I think I'm gonna refer to them as the 11 commandments from now on, but uh, we, ha we have some good questions already, so we'll go through some of these for you, Nate, uh, that, that have come in from the audience. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the uh, first question uh, that really relates to rule number five, uh, don't trust your data, which I, I feel like I'm gonna print that out on like a poster and put it somewhere. And in my lifetime uh, in working with data, that was always always an issue with data quality, but um, how, how do you ensure that you have good data quality or quality of the data when you're doing these uh, your predictive work? I mean, certainly knowing whether a data set is uh, a virginal, so to speak, or not? Are you the first person who has had an association <laughs> with this data, right? Did you mine it from some original source or collect it yourself? That data is much more likely to have problems. Um, the other thing is, again, doing, here's where a gut check is useful, right? Like doing a gut check at every stage of the process. If you're building a model, some of the models we build take a couple of months of work. Um, it totally sucks to have a problem and then realize, oh my gosh, this introduced at an earlier step in the analysis and an earlier step or earlier step. Now you're taking three days a week to solve a problem that if you had just done more due diligence in real time, um, it would have helped, right? Subject matter expertise is pretty helpful here to have a sense of when a data finding is intuitively implausible or when it isn't, right? If you're working in a field where you don't have subject matter expertise, just kind of talking to someone who does in your organization in a different group, cold emailing somebody. Um, but yeah, kind of nip problems in the bud in, in real time, I think is very important. Excellent. You, you talked about um, in one of your, in some of your predictions you have, or some of your analysis you're doing, you have up to 20 different sources. What, what are some of those sources look like? What are the, where are they coming from? Are they public data? Are they data that you're buying? And what, what, what's some of the examples of those? Because that's what our customers deal with every day is, is hundreds of sources of data in different shapes and sizes. Yeah, so the most complex models that we do involve uh, like congressional races. We look at, um, there's polling, 
Um, there's also things like voting records in Congress. There is fundraising data. There is data on how different districts or states have voted in past elections. For the most part, this data is fairly high quality, um, but still it requires like a big team and a ton of cleaning. And again, a lot of a lot of domain knowledge, right? We, we tend to have a preference to focus on data that is publicly available. That's one of the tenets of, um, of so-called data journalism, which is how we describe 538. That tends to increase the transparency. It may not be as important um, when you're in a private setting and you're just trying to make money, nothing wrong with that, right? Um, but do keep in mind that data that is more open source is more likely to have quality control done by, by other people. Um, you know, data from commercial vendors where it's not really vetted, where if there's a problem, um, the customers may not be posting or describing that problem, except the, the person who provides the data. So, you know, often like public source data is, is, is more reliable. Data on which there are a lot of eyeballs is more reliable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, next uh, crowd question is, uh, how do you determine which aspects or attributes to use from your analysis? So how do you build out those feature sets or the labels in your analysis? Again, I'm going to um, refer to the domain analysis, which I think I should make that like the 12th commandment or something. But like, you know, <laughs> if you're, we've, if you're now got 12. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're looking at like a presidential election model, trying to forecast an election, you don't want folkwism stuff like, oh, the candidate with the shorter last name wins, right? You want big, rigorous stuff that um, that fits with uh, both analysis and, and theory of past elections. Um, a lot of political science literature says, for example, that the economy is is pretty important. If the economy rebounds from inflation in 2013, 2014, Democrats will probably win re-election. If it doesn't, they probably won't, right? There is a very robust literature about that. And so if you're specifying a model based on relatively few sample sizes, trusting the expert wisdom on, on that would be helpful. Um, again, if you have a bigger data set, you can be more purely empirical about it. So um, in sports, the data tends to be very robust. You can kind of just say, well, we can just say this is right and this is wrong because we've tested it a thousand different times, right? And we know how significant this conclusion is. Um, but, you know, kind of getting your, I mean, you know, one thing you can do is like limit the number of tests that you run. You don't want to go on too much of a fishing expedition, right? Say here are four or five things that I think might be really important. Maybe test them and it turns out that three of the four are important. The latter one is not. Maybe you, um, maybe you learn that, oh, there's one other ingredient that I wasn't thinking of, but you don't want to, you don't want to, data mine and fish too much or else you start to wind up in a phenomenon called overfitting which is when um you fit an analysis really well to past data but it may not be very flexible or robust to dealing with unknown observations um so you know maybe another way to put it is like keep it simple stupid i think that can be taken too far if problems are inherently complex then then simplifications don't help but usually people Usually people, more times than not, have a bias toward overcomplicating things. Excellent. Uh, there's, there's a prediction question in there, but we'll leave that if we have time at the end. I don't know if you have a prediction on the uh, number one draft uh, seed for the NBA for the last team. But uh, uh, one, one, I'm going to combine two questions, and we can come back to the odd question, the, the odds of getting that player if we have time, but uh, earlier today, uh, Billy Bean was on stage with our CEO and uh, mentioned that, that he knew you uh, and had gotten to know you pretty well over the years. So how did you guys meet is part one. And then part two is what led you away from uh, doing sports analysis and getting more into the um, you know, data journalism type field that you are in today? So. So I, I used to work for a company called Baseball Prospectus, which still exists. And these, this is one of the kind of early, early forerunners in the Moneyball era of using analytics in baseball. And so, you know, Billy Bean was probably stealing our employees and probably uh, reading our site um, and trying to improve upon it, I'm sure. But we, we just kind of traveled in similar circles. Um, 
I mean, the reason why I got away from it is I don't know. I actually, I actually still love sports. Um, I don't really love politics, but there's a lot of interest in politics. I think, um, I think it's a tough road to hoe sometimes because um, people in politics aren't very analytical. I know it's a little bit loaded, but um, you get to a point in an election campaign where people are thinking either in a way that's very partisan or it's very emotional. I mean, elections have consequences and they're pretty important. Um, and they're kind of team sports. People are rooting for a certain outcome. And so kind of my skill is not, I believe me, I have political preferences, right? Um, but I just try to have a lot of practice in separating out those preferences from my ability to do analysis, to, to decontextualize those. Um, but it's not always fun, right? I'm looking forward to, um, you know, November 9th, whenever day I can go to like a Rangers game or a Knicks game um, without the midterm looming over me. Excellent. So do you have a prediction for uh, if Victor, I can, I'm horrible with names, Wham, Wham, Nini, Mia, is projected to go yeah. number one? Do you have any predictions there? <laughs> I mean, you have a lottery, so there's some randomness. I mean, I guess Oklahoma City is really good at tanking. Utah is clearly tanking. <laughs> they trade away Gobert and Mitchell. Um Whereas some teams like San Antonio is just really bad, but Greg Popovich actually tends to have his guys play a little harder. Um, I don't know. Maybe it'll be uh, – maybe the Utah Jazz would be my prediction, I think. Yeah. All right, we'll see. Well, uh, while this is recorded, so we'll come back and see if your prediction is right or not. <laughs> Even the worst thing is like only a 14 – so it's an 86% chance at a minimum that I'll be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you knew that right off the top of your head. So that was, yeah, that was excellent. Um, let's see. Some other audience questions here. Um, how, how do you eliminate selection bias from your data sets? Um, it's a, I mean, that's kind of a big fundamental question. I, I don't even know if there's like any one non-domain specific way to, to answer it. Um, but again, like at, at, the best thing you can probably do is uh, to eliminate your own selection bias, right? Like you can't always eliminate which polls, for example, were, become public anyway. There probably is some tendency of pollsters to not publish polls if they are outliers statistically, and you can't really do anything about unpublished data. Um, but again, having a process where at least you force yourself to be consistent is, I think, pretty um, worthwhile. One unusual thing I'm doing for my book is like talking to actual academic philosophers, um, which I didn't think they would, I would be doing. Um, but their job is to like actually kind of rigorously define rules and ethics that they think make for good ethical principles. Cause it's so much easier to be ad hoc and say, okay, well, um, this is okay. And this is not and okay. Maybe I'm being a little bit hypocritical, but whatever, aren't we all hypocritical? Um, you know, it's a very natural instinct, but like rigorous analysis of any kind um, requires you to try to avoid that. And it says, okay, like, let's say you have a certain model or algorithm or set of procedures, and then a new case presents itself. Well, I would just say, okay, that's an exception, treat that in an exceptional way. What you should really do is then reevaluate your process, say, okay, clearly our model was not very good for handling this case. So how can we improve our model to handle not just this case, but also all the other cases that come up in the future? Um, that process is is quite important to like sports betters, for example, right? If they even, and this is where intuition can be valuable. If they say, okay, my model says to bet on the Giants, but like, I just kind of know the Cowboys are a better bet. Trying to be explicit about that and saying, what is your model handling incorrectly? Can you make a generalization from that? is a really valuable um, enterprise, I think. Okay, awesome. Definitely, definitely agree. Um, a little bit gut there, though, that which goes against your number nine uh, commandment. Yeah. But, uh, but, but it does help. That's where the subject matter expert comes in, like you said earlier. So, yeah, definitely. Um, did you did you always want did you did you grow up wanting to be a data journalist? That was a good question. I saw. I don't think, I don't <laughs> Did you grow up and say, "Hey, I want to do this"? 
fine. I'm 44. Uh, I'm kind of old. I don't know if David Journalism existed really. I mean, there was like Bill James in, in baseball and things like that. Um, no, in my like, we had to write um, in fifth grade like autobiographies of like our future lives. I think I, I became like baseball commissioner in that biography. I was not I was not a journalist in my in my 11 year old mind. So you, you grew into it as well as I, you may have uh, you may have actually helped define the uh, define the the uh, the whole thing to begin with. So. Um, or created the field, I guess, of, of data journalism a little bit, uh, made it more popular for sure. So um, another question that's interesting I, from my perspective, because we, uh, Matillion, we, we deal with um, data scientists and data engineers and ETL developers and all that. Um, so <clears throat> question for you is, do you, um, do you consider yourself a data scientist or a data engineer or uh, in that type of more general uh, categorization of yourself and what you guys do uh, at 538? Definitely a data scientist, sure. Yeah, I probably wouldn't use the term engineer, um, but because I like have, because I'm like building our models myself still, um, you know, that would, I think it's data science, pure and simple, for sure. Excellent. Um, what if, uh, if, uh, another question, sorry, I was reading it. It was weird, worded weirdly. You said you're, um, not to be overconfident, but is it uh, also possible to be underconfident and how you think about, uh, things in your predictions and, and how that works? It's, it's definitely possible. Um, there's a great, so Larry Summers is the former treasury secretary. I heard a great anecdote from him on a podcast one time talking about fiscal stimulus during a recession. Um, but he said, you know, I, Larry Summers, am overweight. Would it be possible for me to lose so much weight that I become underweight and anorexic or whatever? And he's like, it's possible, but that's not the thing I'm worried about <laughs> right now, right? Um, you know, 95 times out of 100, people who build models wind up being overconfident. And um, in theory, Yes, I can think of a couple of cases where the opposite is true. Um, but fundamentally, people, I think, don't realize how much um, harder it is to predict new data than to fit a model to previous data. So the directional bias is very often um, to be overconfident about how well you can make new predictions. If you're very robust and rigorous, you tend to be the right amount of confident. Um, and underconfidence happens occasionally, but it's pretty rare to encounter in, in, in the real world. Excellent. Uh, I think that covers all the questions in here uh, at this point. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Some more came in. I just hadn't scrolled up. So um, what's in your stack for data modeling? I think, uh, I think what the question, you know, meaning like what type of technologies do you use for data modeling? For your predictions um so i personally use stata a lot because it's kind of what i learned and i haven't transitioned away from it but like the team um mostly uses r and, and python are you guys uh, are you guys using cloud technologies with that like keeping you know using aws or azure or how, how are you producing I believe, I believe storing? AWS. this is why i'm not an engineer right I know how to like <laughs> do coding to run a model, um, but I I don't know what our what our stack looks like. We have, we have other very no very worries. Work on that. That's yeah. where I, I geek out a little bit still, even as a yeah. product marketer. So, uh, <laughs> uh, what's been your favorite? And or now the questions are just rolling in. Now we're going to run out of time. What's been your favorite or best discovery in a data set you didn't expect? Good question for you. Oh gosh, that's a great question, and I'm trying to think of <laughs> of an appropriate answer to it. Um, hmm. I mean, the thing about data sets, it's, it's often things that are like are semi intuitive, but defy your expectations a little bit. I'm trying to think of a good example. Maybe I can come back to that one. Uh, okay. All right. 
Well, uh, let's see. The next one was also what was uh, what, what's an example of data surprising you? So, um, how do you convince an audience to move away from gut instinct or emotion or con uh, or confirmation bias? So, how, how do you how do you get? And I think you talked about this, and uh, you do talk about this in your first book a little bit, especially around uh, one of the elections where you did predict. I think like a 28 point something percent chance of Trump winning where everybody else was giving him one or 2% chance of winning. So how, how do you convince people to move away from, from that? With a lot of patience, <laughs> I guess, uh, <laughs> and encouraging people to be like practitioners. Right. So, you know, one reason why I tend to get along with um, poker players, for example, is not just, playing poker myself but also like they understand that you play tens of thousands of hands and they kind of experience these long run probabilities they know that a two outer in poker it's called when the opponent hits one of two cards on the river to make their hand happens about four percent of the time on average you play ten thousand poker hands in that situation you'll see that long run probability emerge pretty quickly um i mean in some ways the new book i'm working on is about um the personality type associated with with being skilled at analysis um and recognize that like it is it is unusual it is in some cases counterintuitive um because it isn't a system two category of problems that that people don't have to deal with they aren't everyday problems for most people um and so again being patient with people trying to encourage people to think more critically just about everything about their own process, trying to tie it to examples that people do understand or have experience firsthand or the kind of starting points, but it's, it's a, you know, lifelong and maybe somewhat thankless task. <laughs> that sounds, uh, sounds like a big challenge, uh, if lifelong task. So yeah. <laughs> definitely. Uh, here's uh, one question before I go back to the surprise data surprising you question, and then we'll wrap up. But what what is your uh, company name? Five thirty eight refer to what is that that from? So five thirty eight is the number of voters in the electoral college. So there are four hundred thirty five um, U.S. House members, one hundred senators, and then three votes for the District of Columbia is how you get to five thirty eight. Excellent. And we'll close. Uh, have you thought of a, a data set or prediction that really surprised you? I did a TED talk once about, um, so on the census, they actually ask people not just for their race, but also their ethnicity. So you can say, oh, I'm Greek American or I'm um, Mexican American or Kenyan American or whatever else, right? Um, some people just say they're American, though. And what I noticed is that um, that this people who say they're American was associated with a big um, shift in votes away from Barack Obama in 2008. And so I think it had to do with kind of this emerging um, kind of rise of Trumpism almost in the data, that it was a way people identify a little bit differently with their ethnicity. Um, so that was kind of the base of the TED Talk. And I remember seeing that and being like, oh, sometimes you can, you know, sometimes answers that don't make a lot of sense on the surface um, can actually provide insight into how people think differently about themselves. Very good. Very good. Well, Nate, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, it has been really great chatting with you and uh, going through your 11 guidelines or commandments depending on how you want to live your life but uh, uh i think uh, commandments are great but we'll, we can go with guidelines <laughs> so it's been been a pleasure chatting with you uh definitely good luck with the uh, midterm elections i want to thank everybody on the um on the data unlocked virtual side of the house for attending uh for listening in uh with all the great announcements today and the exciting things that we uh released and talked about with the data productivity cloud. So thank you again, everybody. And thank you one last time, Nate, for your time. Of course. Thank you.